Um, good morning slash afternoon. I don't know which one we are. Which one we are. Um, we are living in dark times, uh, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, end user UI is running in browsers. Do not connect directly to a peer-to-peer -peer network. Instead, they use publicly available JSON RPC servers, which is insecure, centralized. It's not great. And the solution to that is to basically throw away JSON RPC nodes. And why has nobody done that before? Because the engineering is hard. And why is the engineering hard? Because, well, this is what this talk is about. And this is my talk, creating a browser embedded like client. And I'm Pierre Trigger, AKA Tomaka. So, uh, this talk is in two parts. First, the JavaScript part, the front end part, the browser part. And secondly, the blockchain stuff, how we actually sync, and so on and so forth. So, uh, first part. So, the way we actually um, created this JSON, op this um, light client, sorry, um, is by copying the same API of JSON RPC servers. We wanted to make like it's easy to transition from JSON RPC servers to light clients. So on the left, you can see how you would typically do a normal request to a JSON RPC server, which is like connect to WebSocket, through WebSocket. On the right, you see how you do it with a light client. It's basically the same. You send a JSON RPC request. That was very important because we didn't want everyone to have to rewrite everything from scratch. So if you're using JSON RPC servers, you can easily transition. Uh, the light client is just an npm slash dino package. It works in the browser. It works on Node.js. It works on Dino. It works everywhere. Of course, the main use case is the browser, but might as well make it work everywhere. Again, we want to make it easy to use. And in this package, you have a bit of JavaScript, only 2,000 lines of code, and 92,000 lines of code of Rust compiled to WebAssembly. So that's the actual light client is in Rust. Um, so the first problem that's been encountered is how do you actually make it work? How do you plug everything together? So what you really would like to have is you have your Rust code, you compile it to WebAssembly, and then you use JavaScript WebAssembly.instance.tstreaming. That's what you would like to have. And uh, I put the size of the WebAssembly. I'm going to talk about this. Like It's 2.12 megabytes when gzipped. Uh, however, this doesn't work in practice because uh, our, you will realize it throughout the talk, bundlers and JavaScript engines are our enemy. Like, they don't like us. We have to like, adapt our code to make it work on it rather than the other way around. We cannot use this because bundlers and engines just crash on this. They don't like, fetch something that was them. So the way this was worked around, worked around is to base 64 the WebAssembly binary, and then at runtime decode it and instantiate it afterwards. That's the first workaround. However, as you can see, um, it increases the size of a WebAssembly, so I'm not big into information theory. To me, base 64 should not change the entropy, but apparently it does. Uh, increases the size quite a lot. So, we noticed that if you compress it before, the size remains the same. So now we have to compress the WebAssembly and decompress it at runtime, work around number two. And the um, only problem is 2.14 megabytes is still too big for bundlers and engines. Well, for bundlers in the case, they just crash, they don't like it, there's errors everywhere, you don't know what happens. So work around number three is you split the WebAssembly, the compressed base64 WebAssembly, into multiple JavaScript files of one megabyte each, and then you, rec you recombine them at runtime. You, basic you basically for decode, then you decompress, and then you only instantiate. That's the kind of stupidity, I would say, quote, quote, you have to deal with when actually shipping WebAssembly, and you want to instantiate the WebAssembly in a browser. It's this kind of annoying workarounds a bit everywhere. Um, and that reflected itself in the Rust code, this kind of annoyances you have to deal with. I knew when starting that I would have all the all kind of problems, like the one I just described, where you have to split, compile, whatever. And the consequence is that a constraint that 
we fixed ourselves is to have total control over JavaScript code in order to be able to like, fix these kind of issues in a cowboy way, if you see what I mean. Like, something needs fixing, you want to be able to fix it and not have to submit a pull request to a third party dependency and wait six months, et cetera, et cetera. So must have total control over JavaScript code. Other constraints is there's not a lot of memory available, four gigabytes, that's a web assembly constraint for right now. And um, because JavaScript is single threaded, you cannot have functions that take a long time individually. You want to call a function, you want it to return very quickly, you don't want to spend two seconds verifying something, because during these two seconds, nothing else happens, you're not receiving networking messages or anything like that. So it needs to be very quick. Any function needs to return very quickly. And um, for these reasons, we didn't use Wasm bind gen. I would recommend against using Wasm bind gen. I don't know how many Rust developers are in the room and how many have tried using WebAssembly with Rust, but I really recommend against using Wasm bind gen. Uh, no dependency injection, that was the second constraint, because you don't want to not know where you are. You want to understand everything that happens very easily. And uh, for all these reasons, uh, we couldn't use 90% of the source code of substrate slash Polkadot. Everything was basically written from scratch, mostly in order to have total control over JavaScript. And that's one of the main reasons why I think this was really never done before, is because you actually need to write a client with all these constraints in mind. I, if you try to adapt an existing client, you will most likely fail. I tried for six months and realized it wouldn't lead anywhere. Like, rewrite from scratch, basically. Um, so the way the Rust code is organized is you have a no STD library, small dot, it's called, very generic. You can do anything with it. It's only primitives, only tools, pure state machines. Some sans IO, I don't know how to say that in English, sans IO in French, if you want, uh, which means do not talk directly to the operating system. Instead, like propagate over networking and all the IO in general to the highest level of levels of the code. And only the highest levels of the code communicate with the operating system. Operating system here, is, here means browser or Node.js. Then you have a library called small.lite, also no STD, uh, but more opinionated towards light clients. No state machine. I mean, there are, but it's not the main thing. It's just actors. And then at the top of that, the actual WASM node that we compiled to WebAssembly. Uh, you can see I put WASM32 WASI, WASI, I don't know how you pronounce that. It's the target for, that has some pretty fine bindings to get the time, randomness, etc., etc. I recently changed that to use WASM32 unknown unknown, but to get started, it's very convenient to use was, WASI or WASI because you don't need to do all the I.O. You can just delegate, or delegate the randomness to libraries and the time. And nearly everything was written from scratch, as I mentioned. Uh, next, well, I'm going to talk about how you actually communicate between the node and the chain. The node is in the browser. The browser is a sandbox, a very annoying sandbox. And there are basically four protocols that we could, in principle, use to connect to a chain. WebSocket, non-secure, WebSocket secure, WebRTC, web transport. WebSocket non-secure can only connect to local host. Uh, I don't know why I put this asterisk, but you can only connect to local host. WebSocket Secure needs a TLS certificate, and Web Transport is not ready yet. But in principle, we could use all but WebSocket non-secure. However, there's a twist, which is Google Chrome. So if you have a web page that connects through WebSocket Secure, for instance, to an IP address that was blacklisted by Google, it's going to completely kill the tab and show you this warning. So that completely disqualifies WebSocket Secure and WebSocket in general. Basically, um, anyone could, I don't know, talk about YouTube DL on a website and then use the same IP of a website, get censored by Google, use the same IP, and spawn a node, and then any light can that would connect to it would show this screen, and basically it's an attack on light clients. 
So for this reason, no WebSocket Secure, no Web Transport, although I haven't tried Web Transport, but presumably it's the same thing because it's based on trust, on a trust model. Whereas WebRTC is based on a peer-to-peer -peer model, so presumably this doesn't happen, although I haven't tried, but normally this shouldn't happen. So WebRTC is the pick, the only available protocol. Another problem, just to mention it uh, quickly, it's forbidden to use WebRTC from within a web worker for no reason whatsoever. It's just browsers being a pain in the ass just for the sake of being a pain in the ass. Like, why can you not? No idea. WebSocket is fine. Web transport is fine. WebRTC, you can't. So um, basically, to connect to WebRTC when the light current is running in the background in a web worker, every single networking message is sent to the front, to the front thread, the front end, well, the main page, then sent actually through WebRTC, then every message received back is then sent to the web worker. It's this kind of hacks, like this is one slide, I explained it in 30 seconds, that took two weeks to do, obviously. And it's for this kind of reason, where you want to have total control over JavaScript, and not, if you used wasn't by gen, you would be kind of screwed by this restriction. Uh, another thing to talk about is, what about a browser extension instead of directly putting a light client in the tab itself? itself? Uh, we've experimented with that. It's called Substrate Connect. It's available, like you can download it on, on, extend, on um, the browser stores. And uh, basically, you go on a web page. If the extension is installed, it talks to the, to the extension, which does, does all the light client stuff. If the extension is not installed, it downloads the WASM, uh, instantiates it, et cetera, et cetera. So we tried with that. It has um, and one advantage is the light current is shared between all the tabs. So this means less resources, faster syncing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages. One advantage is that web, non-secure web sockets are usable, which is great in terms of usability. Like, you don't want certificates, so that's a... Uh, that's an advantage, but actually not really, because you don't want the light current to behave differently when the extension is installed or not, because uh, it's the end users who have to install the extension. I, I don't know if you follow my extension. It's the end users that have to install it. So um, this leads to one of the drawbacks. It's confusing for end users. They have to install an extension. They don't really know why. Uh, other advantages is you're not vulnerable to long-range attacks, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, by shipping updates to the extension every now and then. But this creates trust towards the people who ship updates to the extension. Anyone who has access rights to the extension, like on browser stores, could ship a malicious version of, um, of the chain specifications. Basically, can make you connect to a different chain. Um, so this is a plus and minus, an advantage of rollback together. And I just want to talk about Google Manifest V3, which is the main reason why this extension is kind of um, deprecated, slash we're not sure what we want to do with it, because Google Manifest V3 basically would completely kill the extension. They forbid now. So Google Manifest V3 is an update to the extension API between the extension and the browser. And the version 3 would completely um, forbid the use case of light cans. You couldn't run a long running process in the background anymore. And so depending on Google's opinion of things, and they change their mind over time, depending on public pressure, we don't know what to do with this extension. So thank you, Google. Um, so this was all the JavaScript-related stuff. And now part two, all the actual blockchain stuff, the syncing and everything. So the way the light current actually connects to the chain is shown on this slide. First, you pass the chain specification, so describe the chain, the boot nodes, the genesis hash, etc. Et you connect to the peer-to-peer -peer network through WebRTC, as I mentioned. You download proofs of finality. Um, I'm going to explain later. Then you download the WASM runtime of the chain. So if you're not familiar with Polkadot, all the logic of the chain, the staking governance, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is governed by a WASM blob that the light can has to download, basically. And uh, after compiling this WASM runtime, we download the information that lets us continue syncing. In terms of oh, long-range attacks, so the finality proofs consist in um, downloading a series of block headers and 
finality proofs one by one. If your chain specification, so your st the starting point of a download is too far away from the head of a chain, you're vulnerable to long-range at long attacks. The validators from the past could create a separate chain and redirect you to this separate chain. And for this reason, the chain specification must not be too far away from, a, from the head of a chain. Uh, I thought I had a slide in the mid... I'm missing a slide. Well, uh, in terms of um, timings, everything is like constant time except downloading the, the finality proofs, except downloading the headers and finality proofs, which depends on the distance between the head and the, and, and the starting point and the head of a chain. So for this reason also, I was not missing a slide. For this reason also, you don't want the starting point to be too far away. And so what we did is, once you are synced, you update the chain specification so that later, when you run the client later, you stop your browser, you restart it again, you continue syncing from where you were in the past. That seems obvious, but it protects you. Again, like both, it increases the speed of syncing and protects you against long-range attacks. So it's kind of important. Um, in terms of timings, I showed you timings on the screen. Um, so it takes around 0 0.8 seconds right now. These are timings right now, how much each step takes. 0 0.8 seconds to sync like, from a relatively recent starting point, which I think is okay. It's important that it's not too long because we're talking about end users going on a website and this process happens. So I don't want the end users to be shown a, a blank page for too long. 0 0.8 is relatively OK. On the short term, with some optimizations, downloading many things in parallel, et cetera, et cetera, I can probably reduce this to 6.5 uh, tenths of a second. And with more optimization, we can probably reduce to um, 350 milliseconds. So the long-term optimizations would be grouping all the fine, like reducing the size of the finity proofs in one signature, in one aggregated signature, instead of one signature per validator, which is currently the case. Verifying one signature is much faster than verifying 900 signatures, for instance, for Kusama, obviously. Um, another optimization to do is in the um, WebAssembly interpreter. It should be able to compile just the functions that we have instead of everything, which it does right now. Right now, it does everything. But that's all long term. But 350 milliseconds, I think it's pretty good in terms of user experience. It's not too long. You don't really notice it. Uh, when it comes to a power chain, so this was Polkadot or a relay chain, you know. When it comes to a power chain, it's slightly different. And I realized earlier today I forgot to put connect to a peer to peer network in this little schema, but it doesn't change that much. So in order to connect to a power chain, you need to sync with a relay chain with Polkadot, which I just described. And then you download the, the latest the runtime, and you download the state of the latest block from the relay chain. Um, here are some timings. So I forgot to connect to a peer-to-peer -peer network, so you have to add 150 milliseconds or so to the minimum time. So roughly 600 to 1,200 um, milliseconds to connect to a power chain. Of course, you can connect to multiple power chains, and it's done in parallel. Like, the last two steps are parallelizable, and the first as well, actually. Um, in the long term, we can reduce this to half a second maximum, which, again, I think in terms of UI is good. Like, I'm basically showing you that it's possible in practice. You can have good UI sync a chain from a recent point in time and not, like, have a user wait with a with a slider for, for ages. Um, as I've mentioned, you can connect to multiple chains at once because staying in sync with a chain is very cheap. Right now, it's 26 megabytes of memory per chain, which is not that much, and it's not really optimized either. It's just how it is, but I didn't really look into why it's so big, actually. Uh, 1.5 kilobytes of bandwidth on average, relatively, just staying in sync. Um, so. One light can can connect to many, many different chains. I've tried with 70 different parachains. It works 
relatively okay. Like it slows down a little bit, obviously, but it's fine. We don't have 70 chains anyway. And the, the main limitation is the memory space. WebAssembly is four gigabytes maximum at the moment, which gives you a limit to 150 chains, which is more than enough. And if it's not enough, there's 64 WebAssembly coming in the future. Um, I want to talk about uh, the network tip topology. So how do we actually connect? So right clients connect to full nodes in a random fashion. The full nodes that you connect to are discovered randomly and connected to randomly, and there's a rotation happening randomly. It's not completely implemented yet, but that's the design. You rotate the full nodes you're connected to. Um, of course, this is kind of complicated because the discovery is also, like, can be manipulated if you really try. It's kind of complicated, but basically it's random. And the number of connections is adjusted based on load. So by default, it's free, which is, which is enough to resist Eclipse attacks. But if the UI uses a lot, does a lot of queries, then we increase the, the number of connections, and then we reduce them if the number of queries uh, is reduced in the future. And my data are not uh, reachable by light clients, just in case. Like, there's no reason why they shouldn't be, but you never know. Maybe there's a vulnerability or whatever, so we disable that by default. Uh, and to answer a question that might uh, be asked, there's no incentive to run a full node right now. We don't know how to do it. If you have a solution, come see me. The problem is you don't want end users to actually have to pay to, to like, look at data. That's the problem. If, if users would pay, there might be solutions, but... People want things for free, so. Um, and the plan right now is use the treasury as a common good thing to fund people hosting full nodes. Because you still need enough servers to serve everyone. This obviously doesn't remove the need for servers. And to end the talk, uh, a few other things which I don't have time to talk about. Uh, the JSON RPC API, so the way UIs talk to the node, is completely not like current friendly in Polkadot. We copied more or less the same as Ethereum, so I'm not very aware about Ethereum, but you probably have the same problem. We completely did it from scratch, designed a new API that doesn't have problems. I'm not going to go into it. You can ask me questions after. Um, we had to update the try format of Polkadot. Not necessarily for light currents, for other reasons as well, but um, it will make Merkle proofs way smaller and also reduce the bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, a last thing is an experiment to make the light current multi-threaded through web workers. You can actually more or less do that by compiling to a new WebAssembly target that's just been shipped in the Rust compiler because WASM32 was in preview one threads. Uh, the problem with that is it requires shared array buffers, which browsers disable because of security reasons. You need uh, course, you know, the um, cross-origin something something headers, which we don't want to deal with that. So another instance of browsers being a pain in the ass. And uh, it also requires weight async, which Firefox doesn't have. But if these two problems were solved, you could actually have multiple threads running the light current at the same time, which, again, increases the number of chains you can connect to simultaneously if you want. And uh, that's it.